This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Hey, welcome everybody to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Just had a great show with Carl Science called, uh, of course, In the Nest, where I am really high on uh, the Ravens this Sunday against New Orleans. And... Uh, my first segment of this show is going to be twofold. We're going to talk about uh, a big event that's coming up on October 30th. And then I'm going to give you my observations of the basketball team after observing them yesterday. And uh, I was at uh, the media day, got a chance to watch some of the practice. And when you talk about being high on the team, I am sky high on this basketball team. I'll go into it in a few minutes. But first, I want to welcome in Charlie Levine. And his big event is on October the 30th. Uh, Team one up. Team up for one. Team up for one. Of course, I'm always a part of it. Uh, I can't wait for it on October 30th. And uh, Charlie, give everybody a background as to what you do. You've been on the show before and what's happening on the 30th and how they can get seats and the whole the whole trip there. Okay, Team Up for One, we're in our fourth year. Uh, quickly, our tagline's connecting children with challenges to the experience of team sports. So we get these kids uh, with all kinds of challenges that love sports but can't play sports. So we get them the experience of being part of a team. The first thing we can do is match up a kid with a team, high school, college, or professional. And the kids get adopted. They go to practices. They're on the team on the bench at the games. They go to team dinners. They're in the huddle before the games, etc. And when a team adopts a kid, the commitment by the team is for two years. And I can tell you, every kid that's been adopted has been with their kids from the beginning, and they're all still with their team. So we have 75 kids adopted so far. We're growing like crazy. And actually, we have to hire full-time staff because we're opening chapters in Washington and Philly. So the event on October 30th is going to be a big event for us. Wow, that's, it's such a great cause. I've, I've seen the results of it. I was at the dinner last year, and uh, one of the wildest auctions I've ever seen. All right? <laughs> right or wrong? Correct. I mean the auction. <laughs> they came up with some, uh, some events and some tickets to just unusual circumstances. But it was so much fun last year. And... Uh, You also have some silent auctions. I hear you got some great contributions this year. And uh, who's the who's the featured guest this year? It's Ryan Odom, as most of you know, the head basketball coach from UMBC. We're honoring him for the big upset win in the tournament last year, and the whole campus at UMBC is pretty happy about that. They'll be there in in numbers, so we're excited about that. We're also we're going to have one of our board members, Al Smith. He is one of our go-to guys for our board of directors. He was there at the beginning, so we're honoring him, too. We're having a uh, um, few different athletes. Dan White's going to be there. We're going to have, uh, I think, Mark Greenberg from you know, the Cross Icon. He's coming to it as well. One of the greatest defensemen ever. Yeah, he'll be there. From Johns uh, Hopkins. And Janine Tucker, the head coach of um, Hopkins Lacrosse, is coming. And our big draw is um, Matthew Judon is going to be there from the Ravens. Oh, that's great. That's great that you get a Raven. I mean, that's – but uh, besides that, the cause is so great. I implore everybody, if you're available to come, definitely show up. It's at uh, Martin's, the uh, Valley Mansion. The Valley Mansion. So you got more room than, you know. You got plenty of room. You got plenty of room. The food is great. Who you got catering it this year? Uh, it's Martin's. They're doing it. It's a bull roast theme. Okay. The dress is casual. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. Well, everybody knows how great Martin's is and what a great job they do. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a special evening, and you get to see a lot of the kids and the teams that they were associated with. And uh, Ryan Odom. Uh, certainly one of the top figures locally this year after his great win. But more than that, he's put UMBC on the map. And uh, already, I think they have a national broadcast, uh, national broadcast when they play Marquette right. early in the season. And uh, Ryan's been incredible, especially at that new arena at uh, UMBC. Have you been there yet? Yes, I have. It is it is awesome. My buddy Todd Carton has courtside seats, and you know I go there to cover the game, but more to enjoy the game. And uh, parking is easy. Access and egress is perfect, and uh, it's a great night yeah. over UMBC. Yeah, I saw that the new facility. It is beautiful. 
the reason I was there was not only to meet with the athletic department about Ryan, the women's basketball team adopted one of our kids as well. That's great. And they have other teams, and we've never done this before, but Ryan and the basketball team were going to do an adoption ceremony of one of our kids right in front of everybody at the event. That's great. That's great. And uh, it's just great for these kids who, who just can't participate to be part of a team. And mm-hmm. it's I think the real winners obviously are the kids, but the players are the real winners. I've seen reactions and the way they are and how much love they put into the whole situation. And I've never met a player who hasn't come out much better who's thrown himself into the situation. You could see it on the Make-A-Wish uh, show that they have on ESPN mm-hmm. where I saw one with Carson Wentz that was just, it was just unbelievable the, yeah. all that he got out of it. So uh, it's a trend that's go, uh, popping up around the country and certainly, Charlie, you're to be commended for what okay. you do and I love, Thanks. I love being a part of it too. Thank you. Yeah, one of the difference, like Make-A-Wish and Grand Wish, they do great things. They're a one-time event, so to speak. Right. When our kids are adopted, they're for at least two years. Right. So that's one of the big differences. So, uh, but they go through a lot in those two years and the team responds to it. Sometimes they have to go through a lot as if there's surgery or anything like that. Right. And the teams respond to it and the kids have somebody to look to. We uh, we'll take any kid under the sun between five and eighteen cerebral palsy, muscle di- muscular dystrophy, uh, Down syndrome, autism. You know the big C, of course. Any challenge there is, we'll get the kids matched up. And we actually, when I started this four years ago, we uh, I thought I was going to have trouble finding teams to want to adopt. And the complete opposite happened. We have a waiting list of teams who want to adopt, and I have trouble finding kids. We need to find kids who want to do this. So, so uh, if you're out there, our website, teamupforone.org, it's T-E-A-M-U-P-F-O-R and the number one dot org. And go to the website, check it out with our videos, and there's an application the parents can fill out. And also on our website, you can actually buy tickets to the event right there as well. Okay. But I want to say that the event's a lot of fun. It I mean, is. it's a great cause, but more than that, you make it a lot of fun. And uh, I'm sure there'll be another live auction. Yeah. And I'm sure that you have a, I know you have a great collection of memorabilia <laughs> up for sale. All right. I've heard about it and it's really, really nice. Right. We have other gaming wheels will be, will be there. Um, we have a lot of different things going on. A walk around magician for the kids will be there. The Oreo bird, Poe will be there, et cetera. So it's a lot, move, a lot of movement, a lot of things going on as well. And Ravens Roost 27, thank you to them that they're doing the uh, live auction, the uh, silent auction for us. All right, perfect. All right. So uh, stick around. I know you're a big Maryland fan and yep. uh, you can comment as you wish. But yesterday was media day at College Park. And besides a ton of interviews that uh, Wayne and myself got, uh, I was able to watch practice. Coach Turgeon let the media watch practice. And fortunately, he did like a good offensive practice, a good scrimmage. And I will say this with total confidence, that barring injuries, this 2018-2019 band of Terrapins will not disappoint you. From what I saw yesterday at practice, Maryland is solid through at least 10 men in the lineup, maybe even 11. Turgeon has put together perhaps his most talented team in his eight years at Maryland. This is his eighth year. Let's look at Cowan. He's now a junior leader. He will not have to play 36 to 40 minutes like he did last year. He will not be the only guy with the ball like he was last year. Of course, Herter was around too. But there's weapons at all five positions. And uh, this back, we now have a backup point guard that is just, his name is Eric Ayala. He uh, was a... Uh, uh, he went to MIG for a prep year. He was supposed to go to Syracuse. He canceled Syracuse, came to Maryland, and what a plus. What a plus for the Terps. He's 6'5", weighs about 210, and is built like a, built like a solid steel. He kind of reminds you of the prototypical Big Ten guard. This kid is tough as nails. He will fill in for Cowan, maybe play some two as well. But uh, and also, even though Herder is left, Cowan is surrounded which, with much more shooting talent than even last year. More assists for Cowan for sure, less wear and tear, maybe a few less points. But he's going to really get a uh, opportunity to showcase what he can do. This Eric Ayala, I love. Now Bruno seems to be on a mission. I had a chance to talk to Bruno, and uh, it's a couple minutes long, so let's let it rip and let's hear what he has to say. 
Well, it's great to have you back. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so you come back your second year, you got the first under your belt. What is it you feel you have to work on versus last year and uh, versus your efforts at the combine? Um, I think I've worked on a lot of things, a lot of different aspects of my game. I think I've, as a matter of fact, I've worked on every aspect of my game. I try to get better and a, li a little better at everything I do. And, uh, you know, just trying to be consistent for sure. That's one thing that I really um, stay doubting on this whole season and even coming back after the process and um, I mean like my free throws like I mentioned before just try to make sure I knock down the free throws because it's one thing that um, I feel like I can master the free throws and especially being as a big, being a big man in this game today um, you want to be able to you know make free throws and be in, stay in the late game game game, game situations. So uh, the youngster there uh, Jalen Smith comes in have you kind of taken him under your wing I mean is there things you can keep him that you had to go through last year? Yeah, um, I definitely try to help him as much as I can uh, with a lot of plays and, and, and not just plays but also off the court stuff, you know, just making sure like he's making right decisions and, uh, you know, he's doing what he has to do on the court, you know. I'm not, I leave all the teaching really plays and all that, all that kind of stuff that comes with practice before coach but um, whenever I can we both stay in the same apartments whenever I can I always, you know, try to talk to him and make sure he knows what he's supposed to do for the next practice and stuff like that so that's really one thing that me and him have been working on a lot and that's what that's helping us build on our chemistry and bonding, bonding more as a teammate the big 10 you know you go on the road on the big 10 it's a different game i mean you know you better be bring your a game mm -hmm. what have you learned from that from last year how much more ready you think you'll be for uh purdue and some of the places you have to travel to i've learned a lot um i really i've learned a lot uh that's like i said before i think i've grown a lot since last year and, uh, you know, obviously last year as a freshman, um, you know, I didn't really, you don't really know what to expect. And sometimes it takes you two, three, four, five games and however many games it takes you to get accustomed to the things and the way things go. But I think after having a year, you know, a year under my belt, uh, it's something that I, I know what to expect now and I'm used to the things. So I think it would be a lot easier for me to just, you know, be able to play the way I, I, I'm able to play. Well, of course, Terrapin Nation is ecstatic that you're back. Mm -hmm. What came into that decision to come back? Because you were certainly close. Mm -hmm. You know, what made you want to come back to Maryland? Uh, it was really, you know, my my teammates, uh, the team, um, the fans, and Maryland as a whole. You know, Maryland means a lot to me, and uh, that's my that's one thing that I always keep in my heart. And uh, you know, I wouldn't feel, you know, I would never feel bad to come back to Maryland. This place means a lot to me. This place has given me opportunities that I think other places would have never given to me. Um, and um, it was about putting myself in a better position and uh, also, you know, thinking how special we could be. Obviously, coming back and having Jalen and all the guys coming in is just something that we haven't had before. And so, you know, I always really thought about that and my teammates as well. Like I said, and Coach, my relationship with Coach Thurgeon, which just keeps growing better and better each day that we spend together. So that was really all about it, more so than anything. Well, I, for one, think you made a great decision. And Thank I think you. you're going to have a great year. Welcome back. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. Bruno Fernando, man, what a pleasure talking to that kid. He, nice kid. He, yeah, really a good kid. And, uh, you know, he might have, you know, had he stayed, I mean, I heard some rumors that he might have been a late, late first or a, a second round pick, but we don't know. But if he can help Maryland get to a uh, final eight or a final four, the sky's the limit for him. Because this guy, he will be showcased time and time again, especially with Maryland's schedule. Now, Jalen Smith, now, it's funny thing about my audience. Most of my audience, all right, has seen Jalen Smith play at St. Joe's, all right, because it's, it wasn't that tough to get to see him. And we all know about his abilities. His inside abilities are awesome. And we also know last year, every time he played, he was triple teamed. It was ridiculous. He was, They beat him to death. I mean, that was the, the strategy was to beat Jalen Smith to death and uh, to try and get him upset and stuff like that. And he learned that. Now, he said to me, he said, being guarded by Bruno, it's like tougher than being guarded by three people. That's how strong he is. And he was just raving about Bruno. And he is sticks is ecstatic about being with his running mate, Daryl Morsel. And now comes my happiest moment of what I saw yesterday because he's a Baltimore kid and I'm and they're repping Baltimore. Daryl Morsel has arrived. Remember what I said. 
He made four out of five threes in the scrimmage. He was hitting nothing but net. He is leaner, stronger, looks like he grew a little bit. This kid is in great, great physical shape, and his shot has improved tremendously. If you think this is hype for me, it's not. I'm telling you, you're going to flip out when you see this kid play. Get psyched for him because he is going to be special. Now, to that, you add on Aaron Wiggins, one of the most sought-after uh, swing men in the country. Sorrell Smith, another dead-eye shooter. They picked up Ricky Lindo from D.C., all will get playing time. All will be impressive. I watched Trace Ramsey, a smooth left-handed shooter, and if the team can run and dunk gun, he will get his shots and deliver daggers. I watched him make 48 out of 50 jump shots All right, from all over the court. We also have Joshua Tamea coming back and uh, senior Yvonne Bender, who's getting healthier and healthier. This team is loaded I am sky high. If we can survive without injuries, look out for this team. And I don't care if they're under the radar. And I don't care if Dickie V didn't have them in his top 40. That's all garbage. This team is for real. I've never seen Turgeon as excited as he is for a team. And uh, can I be any higher than I am on that? No, I, I think in a couple of months when we start filling out our brackets, I'm going to keep this in mind. Which keep it said. in mind. Keep it in mind we, when we have our dinner. And uh, Billy Smoley and I got your tickets for Virginia. You want it? Go ahead before we uh, go to break. Not only would I love to see the Terps go far, I'd love to see them adopt one of our kids. Well, that's yeah, it's up to them. Okay. But, well, all right. Okay. We'll work on it for you, okay? I, I know you will. Thanks. All right. With that, we'll head out to our first break. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment two, and uh, we have a happy camper on the phone right now, and that's my good friend from Coons Ford, Dennis Kalatsis. Dennis, welcome in, my friend. Hey, Bruce. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Well, Dennis, I, I, I was talking about it uh, before. It was like, what team was that that showed up on Sunday? Was that the team that Weddell talks about? Well, you know what? It's uh, the NFL, once again, uh, proved to be a week to week league, and Anything can happen on any given Sunday. I don't think Tennessee was as, as, as bad as they, the Ravens made them look, and I don't think the Ravens were as good as Tennessee made them look. So every week they got to bring their A game, and uh, this week is no different. I mean, you know, the one thing that I had talked about that I was really, really, first of all, I was Daniel Dean Pease, all right, because I don't like the way he left. It's obviously he had a job set up at Tennessee, and, you know, Big loss. I mean, the guy was the worst coach down the wire that there's ever been. He was the worst for fourth quarter coach you could have. And I was only hoping that we needed a drive in the fourth quarter to win because I know that we would have been successful. And I'm not bashing the guy. I'm just stating the fact. I didn't like the way he left. Harbaugh was pretty damn good to him. He defended him and everything. And then the guy walks out on us like nothing's there. So, but... That loss, to me, is as big a move as getting the three receivers because with Martindale in there in our defense, this guy has been a miracle worker so far. Would you agree? Well, Bruce, the stats tell the story. No second-half touchdown allowed by the Ravens' defense this year. So I think that's a tribute to Wink Martindale and what he does at halftime. I know that they copied the, what the Warrior, Warriors do at halftime, and uh, it's been very, very successful. Dean P has never adjusted after halftime. Uh, and I think that's, that's been uh, Dean's, uh, I mean, the Wings' biggest, biggest strength. He's letting the players have some freedom out there. Uh, there was a blitz in the third or fourth quarter where it was Weddle and Jefferson, and they were talking about who's going to go. And I think that's the kind of freedom that makes this defense click. In other words, the other team can't prepare for that. They're not predictable. They don't know who's blitzing when because the players themselves are making that call on the field at that time in that situation. I go back to that play by number 90. That's Zedarius, right? Zedarius Smith, where he hesitated on rushing the passer, saw the tackle go to his left, and just went in untouched and uh, was kind of like an assist on the eventual sack. This defense has so much imagination that it's unbelievable. Well, yeah, imagination, communication, uh, you know, they're, they're feeling it, and 
again, it's unreal that six games in, they haven't allowed a second-half touchdown. I think that'll change against Mr. Breeze and company, uh, but that means that the offense, they've got to do their job this week and, and score a lot more points than they did uh, the last couple of weeks. You know, I go back to the championship, the original championship year when we had the best defense ever in football. And I just remember that guys, the quarterbacks came in and when they played the Ravens and even throughout Ray Lewis's entire career, they didn't play the Ravens defense the same way. They had to be very, very cautious as to what they did. And I don't see Drew Brees going to town against the Ravens. I might be wrong, but I don't see it. I think that... uh, you can't go to town against this defense. There are so many leaders with Weddle and uh, Mosley and Terrell Suggs, and the defensive line is so strong and so deep. This, this, you know, I'm never going to say it's going to be like 2000, the 2000 defense, but in today's era with all the new rules and the inability to do certain things, if they can stay away from stupidity, that they will be, uh, by the end of the year, a really classic defense. Well, this is going to be a very good matchup for the Ravens, and they'll tell us a lot about this team. Drew Brees has never won at M&T Bank Stadium, but he does have a very stout offensive line. They fire off the ball well. They like to run the ball with uh, with Alvin Kamara. They, they run a half a dozen screen passes a game. They have uh, some big-time receivers. Ted Ginn can get behind the defense, uh, can take the top off the defense. Then you got uh, Michael Thomas, the ex-Ohio State great, uh, doing a great job down there. Uh, defensively, you know, they're, they're aggressive. They float to the ball. Uh, their linebacks are suspect in pass coverage. I think Joe can have a big day uh, hitting his tight ends. But it's going to be a great, great matchup. That's why it's only, it's only a two-point. Uh, the Ravens are favored by two points. Uh, expected to win, but it, it should be a tight one. But a little bit higher scoring affair than we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not. I'm well, they're, not... they're going to score points. They're going to score points. They're going to score. I mean, the Saints are going to score 17, 21, 28 points on this defense. I think they will. And I don't think we shut them out in the second half either. I think if if we do that against the Saints, I mean, that that's going to really tell you something. There, well, well, let's see what happens. But, you know, the one thing I like about the game that you can't forget, now Drew Brees has piled up a lot of his points where? In the Dome, all right? In New Orleans. He threw for 400 yards against the Redskins in New Orleans. He's at our home now. He's coming to M&T Bank on Sunday. It's going to be 35 degrees, all right? You're going to have a team that hasn't been at home for a month. I'm not exaggerating. They have not been home for a month. I'm well, telling you, yeah. look out for this Ravens defense on Sunday. Drew, Drew Brees is not coming in and not going to fool anybody. Martindale will have the defense ready for them. Yeah, he'll score points. I agree with you there. But is he going to run over the Ravens? Not a shot in the world. I don't think. Well, well also, the, the, the ticker prices of Bruce are finally up there. Hallelujah. Up, up, they're, they're above market value for the first time in a long time, right? So this is going to be a, a very loud a very loud stadium. Of the, the home of team fans are going to be sky high for this one, cheering on that defense. Yeah, get your tickets now if you haven't gotten them yet because you're not going to steal them on Sunday. I'll tell you that right now. No, Ticket prices are back and probably be back for the rest of the year because after this, you have the Steelers coming in. Uh, that's the next home game, and then the Bengals. So uh, there's no picnic uh, at home, and these are three tough games. That Dennis, you know, you take a look at the schedule, you see those four tough road games. They're not going to win all four of those games with Atlanta and Carolina and uh, San Diego or the Chargers, L.A. Chargers, and, uh, and Kansas City. So you're going to have to take care of business at home to wind up with a good enough record to win the division. And those games, because of the two losses inside the division, those two games against uh, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, I hate to say it, but they're, they're just like games they have to win. Yeah, they're huge games, but we get we get the Browns, Bengals, and Steelers at home. Uh, we should be able to beat all three teams at home. We owe the the, the Bengals a payback. Steelers, uh, look, they're not the same team. Their defense is very porous. Uh, Levy and Bell looks like he's not going to come back at least until Week Ten, so we avoid him twice this year. Uh, the Browns are going to Brown in Baltimore. We, you know, we owe them a, a spanking as well. Uh, and look, after having four of the first six games in a row, Bruce. You got to be happy with a four and two record. I mean, of no course, matter how you slice of the course. pie, never mind a Cleveland stinker, right? They, they laid an egg against Cleveland, but you know what? If somebody told us, look, they'll be four and two after after the first six games, you'd have to be pretty happy with that with that outcome. Or if we go into Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Tennessee and be two and one, who wouldn't take two wins out of three on the road in the NFL? Nobody. No, they, I they, they, yeah. 
You have to they've be done happy a great with job. Yeah, you they've have done to. A, they've, done a, they've done a great job so far. And look, hats off to the coaching staff. You've got to give Wink, and even Marty, you've got you to give those guys and, and Harbaugh you know, a big shout out six games into the season. Well, I just love how Morningway and Joe got uh, Crabtree right into the offense right away. Crabtree had a big game, uh, held on to every ball, kept a, had a great touchdown catch, and certainly uh, you're going to need Crabtree going forward for sure. And uh, what else can you say? This kid Sneed's got a little axe to grind this week, too, against New Orleans. He is uh, more than anxious, and I understand they're going to make him defensive captain, I mean, offensive captain this week. And well, he should. He's done a great job. Uh, Joe loves to throw to him. He's done a magnificent job on his slot. Great hands, great after the catch. I mean, he's been a real gem for the Ravens this year, as have the other two wide receivers. And it was great to see Lamar Jackson burst a pop a big run. Uh, that led to a touchdown, and uh, it was just that game Sunday was special. It really wasn't a game; it was an absolute massacre. Well, the, the sack fest was just unbelievable. I mean, that that was a long fourth quarter, I'm sure, uh, for the Titans fans to have to sit there through that, that dismal performance. I mean, they just absolutely destroyed them. Eleven sacks is unheard of. Well, you'll be glad to hear it's supposed to be sunny but cold on Sunday, and on Saturday, liquid sunshine, my friend. There you go. I lo- love that. You know, lo- love that inclement weather. Brings everybody inside. Like, they just stay at the auction. Everybody outside, inside. Let's go. That's the way it goes. So, Dennis, what's going on at Coons Ford? I mean, I know the inventory is climbing and climbing, and you've got uh, all kinds of deals. And uh, we still have some 0% because I know interest rates have been rising. Yeah, still 0% on most models, which is uh, amazing. It's and, not going to uh, last. It can't last. No, but we have a, a, a ton of 2018s left. The tremendous value is 2019s are coming in. Uh, we've got them priced to sell. And, uh, you know, given top dollar for trades, as we're still building a tremendous used car inventory that, that you know, that, that we can't get enough of. Uh, we give top dollar for trade-ins. And uh, n- not now is just a great time to come in, whether you're going to 19 or, or 2018. You can't go wrong. Yeah, and I do know I've heard some from some people who bought there that your trade numbers are astronomical right now. Probably as high as they've ever been versus book, aren't they? Well, yeah, nobody nobody gives more for the trade than we do. I mean, we, we give people the right money and then some rather than spending more money at the auction. We'll give them the auction fees. We'll give them the difference right there at the, door, at the front doorstep. It makes sense to me. And, of course, tomorrow you'll be on uh, da- down the dial a little bit on your show from Sunday Sports Voice from 3 to 5 o'clock, and I'll be on, as usual, at about 4.30. So I look forward to talking to you then. Likewise, my friend. Always fun having you on. All right, Dennis. Thanks a lot for checking in, and thanks for all your sponsorship and help. Thank you, Bruce. Go Ravens. Go Terps. All right. Before we head out to the break, we're going to bring in Shaw. We talk a little bit about the event. That's going to occur on October 13th. You were telling me about some of the events with uh, the national anthem and all that. Kind of exciting. Uh, yeah, we, we, we're more focused on the kids themselves for this one. Uh, a couple of months ago, a, a kid named Nick Nauman actually spoke the, uh, sang the national anthem at the Oriole game. Nick has cerebral palsy, and when he did it, it was pretty gutsy. And everyone gave him a big standing ovation. It was well-deserved. And I contacted the Orioles, and they got a hold of them, and he's going to be singing the national anthem at this event. That's how we'll be starting with it. And I mentioned before that UMBC men's basketball, they're going to be adopting one of our kids right there on the spot. And a lot of our kids are going to be doing a photo op with the uh, Poe and the Oriole bird and so on. And everybody will be able to see this close hand. So... It's going to be a fun event, a lot going on all at one time, so we're excited about and it. And don't eat before you come because Martin no. West will pour the food out at you. Their, their, their uh, pit beef is fantastic, no. and their bull roasts are always great. I'm sure they'll pop in some oysters or whatever, and uh, it'll be a great night. All right, with that, we'll head out to our second break. This is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons 4 Turp Talk here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Back in a few minutes with Wayne Viner. We'll talk about Maryland, Iowa coming up and the fact that the Terps are only two games away from being bowl eligible. This is Coons 4 Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Well, this has certainly been an upbeat show for the University of Maryland today. 
Uh, we talked to how high I was on the basketball team yesterday. And, of course, last night, soccer finally pulled the upset that might get them into the tournament if they could win some games in the Big Ten, defeating number 7 Denver 1-0 on a goal by Paul Lynn. And we bring in right now to talk about the big game against Iowa right now, my good buddy Wayne Viner. Wayne, I don't know if you heard my upbeat broadcast on basketball, but I got in one of those moods where I'm getting carried away. Well, I think somebody could get carried away after seeing practice yesterday. The team certainly passes the airport test. If you see the Maryland basketball team walk through an airport, they have the size and the look. And then you see them get out and run. And I'll tell you, one of the guys I was most, I did not hear your session. I've been stuck in traffic as usual in the D.C. area. Uh, The kid Ricky Lindo I thought was a complete surprise to me. He's a 6'7", small forward, power forward, who can get up and down the court, and he had some high-flying plays and some dunks yesterday. And that wasn't even one of the big recruits that Maryland got. Yeah, Certainly the big recruit showed up. And you know, it was amazing that Ricky Lindo was like an afterthought. I mean, he was he came along toward the end of recruiting, and he went uh, kind of like unrecruited. He's a D.C. kid. But, Wow. His stuffs, he had a couple breakaways that were great, and uh, he can play. I mean, this team is deep. Let's get over to football right now. I've got a guest in here today, uh, Charlie Levine. I told you about Team Up for One, and he talked about his event on October 30th. I know you're going to try and make it as well, but uh, a great event. It's a great event. They're honoring Ryan Odom, the head coach of uh, University, uh, UMBC, uh, the guy who pulled the biggest upset in a decade, and it's over at Martin's, uh, Martin's at uh, the mansion in Towson, in Towson, a fantastic place. So, Wayne, uh, I say I told him on Saturday, I forgot to tell you that he was going to be on, but I said, watch the game, and I want your observation of why you think we won or lost. So I'm going to give him a chance to give me a spiel right now. Go ahead. You're up, Charlie. Okay. Well, uh, no one you know pays much attention to the special teams. We do in Baltimore because they're so good with the Ravens. But I was watching, I was watching Rutgers and the bird beginning of the game. The guy fields a fair catch on the five yard line. You know that's that's a, an easy don't do. And then after we scored on the ensuing kickoff, they fielded the kickoff like it was a punt and left it alone. And we got the ball right back. And game was kind of like. In our direction, so special teams is definitely a factor. Yeah, I thought Wade Lee's had a tremendous game, Wade. Well, has he been named a special teams player of the week? I'm not sure if he's a special teams player of the week, but I talked to him yesterday, and that video is up on the Wayne Turp YouTube channel. It didn't make it up to the big site yet because anybody who's seen Turp talk over the past day or so, it looks like it's the Super Bowl of Maryland. We've got so much video and content up there, there isn't room to put the punter on. (laughs) He uh, spoke about growing up in Australia and what he misses back home, and he also said they gave him some freedom to just kick the football, and he's taking advantage of it. And he, he certainly has been a revelation since he started to punt like a more American punter, Bruce. Well, here's a key stat. He had six punts for 250 yards, an average of 41.7, long of 54, inside the 20, five punts, Wayne. Five punts inside the 20. And that contributed to a game that wound up 34-7. to They could very easily have been 64-7. to But Yeah. Uh, Do you realize that even counting interceptions, because Rutgers completed five passes to Maryland defenders and two passes to their own players, that still only made them 7 of 17. They weren't 500 <laughs> in passes. And at 50%, including the interceptions. And that was, and I've said it before, this will be the last time I get to say it, they're bad on offense, they're bad on defense. As it was just pointed out, they're bad on special teams. Not much hope there in no, Rutgers. I go a step further, they're horrible on special teams. I mean, they, what they did was just one mistake after another that came back to hurt them. I got uh, one question, real quick question. Go ahead. Our punters from Australia, how do they find these guys? They find them. We had a place kicker from Australia, and uh, mm-hmm. field hockey and lacrosse always gets kids. But that's a good question, Wayne. Uh, why, they, they I might volunteer to be the Australian search guy, all right? You, 
We will send you to Boca to warm me up first, then maybe Australia. <laughs> All right. But th- there is a search firm over there, in the same way that they identify 6'10 Nigerian basketball players, there are people that go out and look for guys who are, have exceptional kicking skills, and they refer them, ask if they want to go to college in America, and then they set up these interviews. Why and is Wade Lee? Why is Wade Lee's thirty years old and been undiscovered? What did he do beforehand? He played a lot of Australian rules football, and he didn't have a degree, and he wanted a college degree, and he saw other people doing this, and he found the connections. So he found Maryland as much as Maryland found him, and now he's he's got his four year degree, and he's on to the master's program, and he is the second oldest player in Power Five football so is this definitely his last year he joked about going on pension after this yeah but, but yes, I mean, he'd, like, he'd like to kick an nfl is what he said in the interview if he can and he's going to get a, a chance of some different weather in iowa it's supposed to be uh start off in the morning i believe mason said about 29 degrees with a 25 mile an hour wind on saturday in iowa city the wind's supposed to stay all day. The temperatures get up around 50. But I've been out in the Midwest when the wind blows like that. So let's see what he has against this Big Ten weather. A gray, 50-degree, 25-mile-an-hour wind day with Iowa. And that's interesting as much for Iowa, who doesn't run the ball as much as they used to, spending a long time uh, this season developing a passing game. We're not the same Iowa that you have seen before. And uh, Coach Canada spoke about that. Yeah, I know what uh, else Coach Canada spoke about a lot the other day. And uh, I thought his answer to my question about Kasim was pretty good. The fact that Kasim's three touchdown passes were absolutely dead on the money. And can he get him to translate that to all of his passes? And if he can... And I remember, Kasim's only played seven games. This is not a kid with, like, years of experience. It showed a lot of hope on Saturday, Wayne, against Rutgers. One of these days, I said that on the Young Terps podcast, which is also up on Terp Talk, one of these days this offense is going to work. And I'm starting to wonder if Kasim just missed a few passes that would have made it that 60-7 to that you just spoke about. Maybe this Saturday of the day that he actually makes a few of those connections will look a little bit more like Texas. We have a puncher's chance of taking down number 19. Iowa on their boards are a little concerned about our ability, the Maryland ability to run the ball and control the clock. Well, the big wind will help us out because it sure is hard to pass into big winds. But uh, I don't know. You know, Maryland's due for, you know, they had a big win against, uh, what's Texas now, aid the nation? I mean, it was a huge win, and uh, they got a shot to do another one against Iowa. You got a shot against Michigan State, who's still ranked. And there's four games that we got to win, two. It all comes down to that. And if they win three, then uh, we'll basically have our pick of second-tier bowls. Uh, well, I know Maryland wants to get to the pinstripe bowl. Okay, so that's the their Yankee goal. Stadium. That's probably that's only going to take six wins. That's a six-win ball. Now, I also got a chance to talk to Byron Cowart, and they're all getting ready to go to Iowa, but Byron Cowart was the number one defensive lineman in America coming out of high school, and as everybody probably knows, he went to Auburn, didn't work out there, and he came here. And he said something I found very refreshing and interesting, which is he spent most of his life being the biggest, strongest guy in the field, and he didn't know that much about football. And since he came here and has worked on his technique, he's starting to see the results that he wanted for himself. And that includes an interception, a sack, a tackle for a loss. But he's seen for the first time as a Terp, he was dominant last week. What did you make of his play, Bruce? He was great, and he's, the, you know, early in the year, I kept saying to you, where's Coward? I'm not seeing his name. I'm not hearing him with tackles. And each game, he's gotten a little bit better. And the best news about Coward, if I'm not mistaken, we have him one more year. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe he is a senior now, but because of how he got to Maryland in the years he took off, he has one more year of eligibility. Right, and that's... So, well, he's listed as a junior transfer. 
All right, so I don't know how it works anymore. You know, you, he didn't sit out a year, did he? I believe he did. He did he sit out a did year. did sit for a year. Well, it was a great so. get by uh, DJ Durkin. And, of course, might we see the end of the final decision this week, or you think it's still not close yet? Uh, they have to drag this out a little more. I, it's only been how long? He's well, going gonna, gonna to end up getting paid for the whole season, and he won't coach a game. And and that's going to be, you know, that's just the way this goes. But you led the roundtable of sports writers at uh, the luncheon yesterday. Did anybody think he was coming back as the coach? Everybody kind of thinks, you know, negative, but there's still some hesitation. I'll tell you the truth, nobody knows. I don't know how else you can put it. There's no inside information. There's no, I know this guy who says this. Even on Terrapin Times, you never hear a word, yes or no. You just don't. It's that simple. So let's look at Iowa real quick, uh, Wayne. Tell me about this quarterback, Stanley, who only threw for six touchdowns the other day. Well, he's found some targets. He's got a 6'5 tight end. And he's got two of them. One of them has an injured hand. Between the two of them, I believe they have nine touchdowns. And it keeps being brought up that Maryland historically doesn't cover tight ends very well. Well, we better, if we want to win this game, you have to start covering the tight end. They split the tailback job between three guys. Uh, Anybody who's watched Iowa over the past years, there was a kid named Wadley who was a tailback and a good one for, I think he started for three years. And he's gone. Defense has been very good. Much better than most that we face. But yet again, they're concerned about us. They don't get to play us very often. And they're looking at us with this gaudy per rush average as a team that could cause them trouble. This is not the traditional super tough Iowa teams we've seen before. They throw the ball a little bit. And... uh, Look, yeah, they're going to have to face the same weather and the same wind. They're five and one. They're ranked nineteenth, but they're not untouchable. No, they're not. And uh, if it was at Maryland, you know, uh, I'm sure Iowa would still be favored, but it'd probably be three or four points. As it is, they're a ten point favorite, and that line's been dropping, which is very unusual. Is someone hurt or someone questionable for Iowa? Because the spread started at twelve, and now it's down to ten. Yep, and I think more people are starting. When you look at Ty Johnson and you look at McFarlane, these are legit weapons. I do. I know we're getting close on the clock here. I had some fun on Sunday. I watched the what I'm now calling the Carolina Terrapins take on the Redskins, and of all the players, uh, Torrey Smith, who had done nothing all year, had a pretty good game. Vernon Davis scored a touchdown. And Torrey Smith, I was excited to see, caught the ball up twice. But there was a lot of Terrapin action on that field in uh, at FedEx Field. Let me correct you. It was, D- it was D.J. Moore who caught the, caught the ball up, not Torrey. Torrey came in oh. off the bench and had five catches, including right. a touchdown. He had a hell of a game. But uh, Mar- right. uh, the Ravens get to see Carolina next week in Carolina, and I'm sure it'll be a – a different effort than uh, they had against uh, the Redskins. But quite a weekend last week for the locals between the Ravens and the Redskins and uh, the Terps. And I only include the Redskins when you're on because nobody cares about them around here. But <laughs> we'll let that go. Yeah. But anyway, Wayne, I thank you for coming on. And uh, Wayne will be in Iowa with Mason covering the game. We'll have you on. I'm sure you'll be at some Maryland tailgate if there is such a one uh, on Saturday morning. And the game time there is, what, 11 in the morning? Yeah, they Nebraska, Iowa, two of these road games, nobody's happy about going to a game at 11 in the morning, but we're going to think it's it's New Year's Eve. It is homecoming in Iowa City. It should be a great atmosphere. We'll talk to you on Saturday. You got it. Thanks a lot for checking in, Wayne. All right. That about does it. It's Bruce Poser. Charlie, we thank you for coming in. We'll talk more about the event in the next couple of weeks. Thank you for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, we certainly want you to call in on next Saturday so we can remind everybody about it. And with that, okay. we're heading out. This is Bruce Posner. Have a great week, everyone. We'll be back Saturday with Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven.